Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's session. Today, I want to talk about creativity and business ideas so we can take advantage of entrepreneurial opportunities. So let us reflect on this topic uh, for today's lecture, and hopefully there are some insights uh, or kernels that can be helpful for your research and creativity. Let us look at the trends that we see nowadays. When it comes to ideas, let's look at the past decade and what has been some of the most popular trends, for example, um, in um, our countries or in the world, whether it's through traditional businesses or e-commerce. Think about wearable trends, uh, green trends, uh, the payment industry uh, going digital, uh, the maker trend, the mobile trend, the health trend, in the internet of things or smart devices that are basically flooding our retail stores and our computers or our phones every time we go on a social media website with all these advertisers. So the trends can be sources for new ideas, but on top of that, some of the most fruitful sources of ideas can be your consumers who are using your products right now. Or um, if you're not in the business in the current times, you can survey consumers in terms of what their needs are, what their wants are, what their desires are. Existing products or services that you're offering can be a good source of ideas in terms of making them a little bit better, a little bit more efficient, or using technology to offer more services. Distribution channels can be a source of idea. So how can we provide the product or service using new ways, new methodologies? How can we make it more efficient? How can we add more quality by delivering the product or service on a just-in-time basis and so on? The federal government can be a source of new ideas because they often offer contracts for um, you and I to bid on or to conduct research. And finally, academic as well as corporate research and development departments can be sources of new ideas for all of us, not just for academic publication purposes, but also for the creation of new products and services. How do we generate new ideas? What methods or methodologies can we use? Well, some of the companies use focus groups, which is controlled by a moderator, which leads to a group of people in an open and in in-depth discussion about a specific product or service. You can use brainstorming, which has been popular over the past four or five decades. Brainstorming allows creativity in a group exercise while well, everybody, which could be your employees or it could be your customers, has fun. In brainstorming, make sure there's no criticism. It's usually freewheeling uh, in, in format. Anybody who comes up with ideas, you write it down, you um, share it, you discuss it, you expand on it. Quality of ideas is the key when it comes to brainstorming. In a combination of ideas and improvements is encouraged among everybody. So when one person mentions one thing during a brainstorming session, somebody else think of new ways or other ideas. There's also the concept of brain writing, which is a written form of brainstorming. You can also have problem inventory analysis, uh, sort of like a focus group by the members of problem inventory analysis uh, tend to focus on product uh, problems that you may be experiencing rather than coming up with new ideas um, for um, entrepreneurship or for a new business or for extension of your current business. Nonetheless, experts do provide some advice on how you can be more innovative or how companies have been innovative. So let's look at one of these examples. Um, in terms of what has been reported in business news. In this little segment that you see uh, right now, you see that uh, Neil Franklin created his company in 1998 
based on a 24-hour telephone assistance program. Indeed, he invested in a telephone system that would reroute calls from the office to employees on call at home. This venture was a big success, but the same could not be said for other trials that Franklin attempted. In one venture, he tried to create a system by which he would develop individualized websites for each of his customers. He recalled that he spent too much time and money on this venture that had to be terminated in the end. He also engaged in a major project to extend the company's brand through extensive promotion in major cities. Although the project provided some benefit, the substantial cost meant that the project was a net negative and was eventually terminated. Franklin's efforts can be considered from a portfolio of initiatives perspective. That is, some entrepreneurs engage in multiple trials realizing that some will work and others will not. By actively managing these experiments, the entrepreneur is able to gain information about different potential opportunities, while at the same time reducing the cost of trial that does not show promise. Now contrast this approach to the classic business plan. The business plan contains assumptions about the future and makes substantial commitments based on these assumptions. But for entrepreneurs, the future is typically uncertain. That is, it is difficult to estimate market demand, technological development, and trajectory customers' responses in competitor actions and reactions. Rather than put all of your eggs in one basket, entrepreneurs can use a portfolio approach to ensure that at least some experiments will pan out. There are three primary steps for enacting the portfolio approach to entrepreneurial ventures. First, engage in search where the entrepreneur already has some knowledge and experience. In this way, they may already have an advantage over others given their idiosyncratic background. With more knowledge, the entrepreneur not only already has an advantage, but is also likely more effective at creating, at running, and at interpreting these experiments. Second, engage in low-cost probes. To the extent that the probe or experiment is low in cost, the entrepreneur can afford to have more of them in his or her portfolio. And given the small initial investment, he or she is more willing to terminate those that do not show a promise. This requires a disciplined approach and an understanding of how one probe relates to others in the portfolio. The probes need to be sufficiently diverse that they reveal different information, but not so diverse that they extend beyond the firm's competencies in overall strategy. The probes need to be sufficiently diverse that they reveal different information, but not so diverse that they extend beyond the firm's competences and overall strategy. Third, be prepared to pull the plug. The portfolio of ventures approach works based on the notion that those ventures that do not show promise are rapidly terminated so that resources can be redeployed to those ventures that do show a promise. The approach breaks down if resources are tied up on ventures that are underperforming and do not show sufficient promise. So again, there are some really good suggestions for being more innovative. If you're struggling in your business, reread the three suggestions and brainstorm with your employees, with your colleagues on these topics. And of course, research and development does help. 
So the question is, does research and development spending correlate to being more innovative in your organization? For the past 10 years, the management consultancy group, formerly known as Booz and Company, has tracked research and development at the 10,000 biggest spending companies in the world. Collectively, these companies spend $647 billion on research and development, which amounts to about 40% of the total innovation spending by all public, private, and non-profit organizations worldwide. Across all companies tracked, computers and electronics, healthcare, and the automotive industries collectively make up two-thirds of all research and development spending identified. But the 647 billion figure identified was the second slowest rate of growth in the 10 years that the study has been tracking such data. Yet research and development intensity, the ratio of R&D spending to revenue remains close to the 10 year average of about 3.7%. The firm also surveys 505 innovation leaders at 467 companies to develop a list of the most innovative companies. Consistently, they have found that the companies identified as the most innovative are not the ones that spend the most on research and development. In addition, one of the senior partners of the strategy and noted, our study has consistently shown that there is no statistically significant relationship between financial performance and research and development spending. With R&D intensity remaining relatively constant, the slowdown in R&D spending growth may be an indication that companies have realized that spending more does not always yield better results. So if the data suggests that a company cannot buy its way to the top of the innovation list, what does factor into being the most innovative company? Over the years, um, Researchers have identified five factors that seem to make a difference. Number one, strategic alignment. The most successful innovators can articulate a clear group of R&D priorities that are fit for purpose, aligned to the company's overall business agenda. The ability to do this should not be taken for granted getting the story right and tying it to innovation priorities can take a great deal of thought in iteration. Second, innovative capabilities. There are the everyday activities within your research and development department that you follow along the path from customer engagement to generating ideas to commercializing them to executing the launch. The most successful innovators have developed distinctive R&D processes that are tailored to their own value proposition, not necessarily benchmark from studying other companies. The best of these innovative capabilities tend to be cross-functional, which means it involves people from marketing, from IT, manufacturing, other disciplines, such as research and development and they're creative. In other words, they're prepared to experiment, to iterate and to evolve practices as needed as they move along. Third is external networks and partnerships. Successful innovators are proficient at building and maintaining productive relationships with outside suppliers, distributors, educational institutions and service providers. They know how to draw ideas and capabilities from outside the enterprise as needed for use at various points along the innovation value chain. For organization and processes, organizational design is natural to successful innovators. They make sure the right incentives, decision rights, and information flows are in place to drive innovation performance. They also know how to place the right talent in the right place at the right time. Last but not least is cultural alignment. These companies foster thinking and conversation that promotes innovation. Their cultural attributes and behaviors lay a foundation for risk-taking, and they also support the innovation strategy.
So research and development does not necessarily correlate with being the most innovative, but the discussion, the fact that you encourage employees to get together and be in teams and think creatively might actually lead to more innovations. But the spending on it does not necessarily always mean you will definitely get more products. But when people are coming together, they can creatively solve complex problems. Creative problem solving is very important. There are a number of uh, ways you can solve problems creatively among yourselves. Brainstorming is the most widely used technique. Reverse brainstorming is similar, but criticism is allowed. The Gordon method slowly reveals the problem to group members and ask for suggestions. The checklist method is a list of questions to guide the direction of developing entirely new ideas. Free association is a simple method of creating a chain of ideas. Forced relationships tries to force product combinations. The collective notebook method asks for written suggestions. Attribute listing looks at problem attributes from various viewpoints. The big dream approach asks the entrepreneur to think big. And parameter analysis involves parameters in creative synthesis. So use whatever creative problem solving technique that is most suitable for your business, for your team, so you can solve problems and generate new ideas in filling your customers' needs better than your competitors. And keep in mind that innovation is key to economic development of any company in most industries. Without innovation, they cannot survive for too long. Innovation can be categorized based on the uniqueness of the idea. You can have breakthrough innovations, which are unique and often establish the platform on which future innovations are developed, like airplane, you know, moving from cars and railroad to the plane, um, and moving from telephone or telegrams to the internet. Then you have technological innovations, which occur more frequently and offer advancements in the product or market area. So the jet airplane was a technological innovation when we already had planes, but then you got jet airplanes. And then you have ordinary innovations, which occur most frequently and usually extend a product into a better product. Um, and that's all. So you get a jacket, but this jacket can be used for winter or summer, right? So that is an ordinary innovation. Or maybe some jackets can be worn inside out, maybe with different colors. Maybe the sleeves could be removable, who knows? But these are ordinary innovations that could bring your business additional revenues and be seen as a created brand. Nonetheless, product uniqueness is often defined by your customers, right? And what they perceive to be unique. The change may be in the product itself. The product may be repackaged. The product may have only minor improvements. And the product may simply be similar to a competitor's product, yet still be seen as unique by your customers. And new products can be classified from the viewpoint of the consumer of the firm. Consumers may look at how much behavioral change or new learning is required. So there's continuous innovation, which requires no new learning or behavior change. Dynamic continuous innovation requires some relearning. And in this continuous innovation are the truly new and rare uh, products that we create. And some firms can also view newness by difference in the technology used or the market that they are serving. So change in technology can range from no change to brand new ones. Change in markets range from the same product to a new market. And complexity increases with change in both dimensions. So what is discontinuous innovation? This is where consumers are introduced to products that require a change 
in their current mode of behavior. For example, the corporation that you and I know as Sony, they introduced a new high definition television, which would be incompatible with today's broadcasting standards, which would require you to seek out special sources of programming. Entrepreneurs need to recognize the opportunity. Some entrepreneurs recognize a business opportunity and this is fundamental to the entrepreneurial process. The key lies in the knowledge and experience of the entrepreneur and his or her teammates. Being alert, having a large network of helpful people or other important factors and recognizing the opportunity when it comes about, and then you take advantage of it. So an opportunity analysis plan is also a good method for assessing each new idea. Uh, now, opportunity analysis plan is not a business plan, but it helps decide whether to pursue an idea or not. There's an article by Amy Wilkinson where she talks about the secret of how to think like an entrepreneur. Um, that video is available on YouTube. I encourage you to see that video. And she makes three different points here. She says that there are three major skills needed to think like an entrepreneur. First of all, she says, use the OODA model. The model stands for observe, orient, decide, and end. OODA model, observe, orient, decide, and end. So companies like PayPal and others that are used as an example here um, do a lot of work and rework and they try. So they observe, orient, decide, and act on businesses that make sense, despite the fact that some of them may not lead to any successes. She also says, fail wisely. It is perfectly okay for the entrepreneur to fail. Failure can be a benefit that entrepreneurs learn from. So making a mistake is not the end of your business, but you have to know when to pull the plug. And she also mentions gift small goods. It is a small kindness, a favor that you can share with people and help them. So sort of like Ben and Jerry's uh, ice cream founders, they mention as you help others, others help you. So again, gift small goods in a way to enhance your reputation and be seen as a socially responsible business that will help you sustain over time and enhance your brand image and also expand your network as well. When it comes to product planning and development process, there should be some evaluation criteria that uh, must be inclusive and somewhat quantitative. Number one, a market opportunity, inadequate uh, market demand must exist for your product. Number two, evaluate current competing producers, uh, prices and policies for impact on market share. Third, new products should have synergy with existing capabilities. Number four would be new products should support and contribute to financial well-being of you, your team, and your organization. And number five is evaluate compatibility with existing machinery, your personnel, and the competencies and the skills and the knowledge that you already have. And finally, evaluate the idea throughout its evolution. Evaluation, making sure you're going the right direction are key elements of product planning and development processes. There are five stages of product development. There's the idea stage where you identify promising new products and eliminate impractical ones. In this stage, you determine the need for the product and its value to the company. Second is the concept stage 
where the refined idea is tested to determine customer's acceptance. Will they like it? Will they buy it? Will they promote the product? Third is product development. Consumer reaction to the physical product is assessed, measured, and gathered. And fourth is the test marketing stage, which provides actual sales results that indicate the consumer's acceptance level and um, eagerness to buy and use your product. And finally, step number five is where you sell the product, otherwise known as commercialization of your product, the commercialization stage. When it comes to commercialization, e-commerce in modern technology is a great tool. So you should use e-commerce creatively, use full insourcing, full outsourcing, or a hybrid approach to use e-commerce to promote your product. Front-end activities can include anything that the customer interacts with. Back-end activities include your IT, your payment method, your search and your order fulfillment and so on. So integrate e-commerce and technology into front-end and back-end activities. E-commerce channels can include using a website to promote your product and sell your product locally, nationally, and internationally. And uh, e-commerce channels could be a dedicated mobile optimized website and app. You can use websites or you can have a dedicated mobile optimized website as well as apps. Just know that e-commerce is an essential component of selling any new or existing products in today's environment. So use it wisely. Regardless of whether you sell your product through a website using modern technologies or face-to-face -face or through brick and mortar, uh, traditional formats using buildings, using companies, using retailers uh, in shops, you need to develop trust with your audience. If there's no trust, you cannot sell to them in a sustainable manner. So let's look at what factors actually shape trust in a business environment, especially a business that is constantly innovating. Trust is a powerful tool of influence and management. People respond to authority, not from a desire to follow orders, but because they trust the leader to steer them in the right direction and uphold his or her commitments. To be successful, the 21st century entrepreneur must abide by the rules of trust and lead by example. For the past 15 years, Edelman, the world's largest public relations firm, has tracked trust in the global institutions of business, government, media, and non-governmental organizations, otherwise known as NGOs. For the first time since 2008, overall trust in business decreased by 2% from 59% to 57%, with levels of trust decreasing in 16 out of 27 countries that they surveyed. Over the years, Edelman has identified four factors that impact public perception of trust in business. Industry type, country of origin, enterprise type, and leadership. Regarding leadership, the study found that academics, industry experts, and technical experts remain the most credible spokespeople for business compared to their chief executive officers. Aren't we lucky to be in academia? People still trust us because we make decisions based on facts. For the first time in 2014, the Edelman Trust Barometer asked informed publics about their levels of trust in innovation. While trust in innovation varies across regions and industries, two key factors were consistently recognized as actions that business can take to build trust in innovation. Transparency and third-party validation. Specifically, the survey identified five actions that increase trust 
in industry to implement technology changes. First, make test results available publicly for review. Second, partner with an academic institution. Third, run a clinical trial or beta test. Fourth, partner with an NGO or non-governmental organization. Fifth, partner with government. The study also found that trust carries important implications for future business success. Specifically, 80% of the respondents said that in the previous year, they chose to buy products or services from trusted companies compared to 63% who refused to buy products or services because they distrusted a particular company or brand. In addition, 68% of the respondents said that they would recommend trusted companies and 58% said they shared criticism about a distrusted company. So trust plays an important role in an entrepreneur's success and new product creation. As always, aim to be a trusted entrepreneur, an ethical entrepreneur, an ethical global researcher. Good luck.